start with the good news, which is that we have uh, Yu Kui with us uh, today, this afternoon, from Leifana University, all the way from, from Germany. Leifana is in Lüneburg, and he's, he's based in Berlin. And we're also really pleased to have with us this semester Luciana Parisi from Goldsmiths. She's a visiting professor in rhetoric. And she'll be on our panel later this afternoon with Warren Sapp, who's coming from Santa Cruz, a good friend of the Berkman Center for New Media, and also a member of Citrus, uh, which is housed in this building. <clears throat> and so that's the good news. The unfortunate news is that our other guest, Eric Pearl, who was supposed to be with us as part of the program, uh, had to cancel for urgent personal reasons at the last second. So he won't be able to, to join us for this afternoon, which is a real shame. He was looking forward to it, and we were looking forward to having him in conversation, in part because he's a collaborator with Luciana and teaches with, um, with Yuke as well. And it's just a, a shame, but we're going to forge ahead, and we'll have different ideas, I'm sure, that will come out of today. I just wanted to, to thank the Berkeley Center for New Media for, for funding this, this symposium as part of the History and Theory of New Lecture, uh, History and Theory of New Media Lecture Series, which is organized um, now in the seventh year. Uh, myself and Gail Cosnick put that together, and with the help of uh, Lara, not the help, with the extraordinary support of Lara, and um, thanks to Nicholas de Monchot as well. We also had really uh, generous support from the Townsend Center for the Humanities and the Dean of Arts and Humanities. So, You'll be disappointed that instead of Eric, you're going to have me give the first talk in the symposium uh, because I'm not German and I did not study with the esteemed Friedrich Hitler. I'm Canadian and I missed out on studying with the esteemed Marshall McLuhan. So, uh, but I'm going to I'm going to give basically the, the symposium was to try and really think about some of the political implications of contemporary media philosophy which uh, Luciana, Eric, and you are really some leading, leading thinkers in that domain. And I take a kind of historical approach to this problem, and I was really interested in seeing what, what some of these contemporary thinkers are doing in this, in this space. And so what I want to do today is kind of frame some of those contemporary questions as I see them, and look a little bit more closely at the sort of historical uh, problem of the political and how it echoes with some of those contemporary questions. So hopefully that will set up some issues that we can talk about later in the panel. So I will begin, as, as I did with the framing of the symposium around this question of the ecology of mind as it comes with Bateson. We look at Bateson writing in the 1960s, basically. You know, he very early on saw the problem as really the enmeshing of the human mind in what, what he called the larger arcs or circuits of technologies, environments, institutions, social systems, and he wanted to emphasize that these, these were the places where cognition happened. It wasn't just the individual. And that he was quite optimistic sometimes that these systems could have creative powers. And I think this was the, the obviously the time, Santa Cruz, 1960s, that, that, that gives a kind of optimistic spin to this particular development in the history of technology. <clears throat> but very soon after, we could see the beginnings of let's say, uh, another, another take on this particular enmeshing of the human mind, cognition, and particularly the digital technology of the computer, which is, in 1990, Deleuze already kind of seeing the implications of what he called the control society, where the computer, rather than physical barriers, physical coercions associated with state control, what, what um, Foucault called the disciplinary society, was beginning to track individuals who are no longer even individuals in the kind of political sense of the old traditions, but now what he called individuals, um, capable of being in some ways uh, exploded along much different kinds of topologies and relationships that no longer mapped onto traditional categories. So this is what we now kind of live with today in, in a way that we're much more familiar with. And what I want to emphasize um, in this contemporary moment is this emphasis in, in what uh, Louvois and Burns have called algorithmic governmentality or algorithmic governance, the emphasis in these new domains of enmeshing of the human mind, the nervous system, governance, digital technologies, machine learning in particular, the ways in which these, these systems 
are more and more emphasizing automaticity and, as they say, the effort to avoid the unpredictable, to predict humans and to, to govern along the lines of not just automatic machines, but also to avoid future unpredictability. I think this is related to, but not exactly the same, um, uh, the same kind of spirit of what Jenny Morozov has called Silicon Valley's desire to create the frictionless future, this, this spirit of what he calls solutionism, where the happy CFO, Patrick Pichette there, the bottom, <coughs> desires to fix the broken world through technology. So it's not even necessarily a technocracy, but the idea that technology will eliminate the problem of the political, the problem of conflict itself. So at a, at a kind of higher conceptual level, I think this is what Bernard Stigler is, is emphasizing in his recent work uh, on the automatic society, is the idea that this spirit of calculation, of algorithmic and what he calls mechanical becoming, is really the the spirit of our of our times, the, the not just the machinery and the, the, the capitalistic effort to automatize, but really the, the overall global effort to homogenize through digital technologies the way that humans, machines, uh, the digital network uh, is an effort to eliminate the unpredictable. And, and the point is not to say that there's an opposition between automaticity and the human, but for Stickler, the automatisms that come through culture, through language, through learning, through knowledge production, uh, traditionally were separate domains that could interact and sometimes even come into conflict with one another. But, but when we live in what Deleuze called the control society, when digital technologies permeate all of the domains of society and move to homogenize them through digital technology, what we lose is that possibility of conflict. So that's essentially um, what he means by the automatic society becoming a place where automation is writ large now. Okay, so the one place um, contemporary theorist that's trying to think about this in explicitly political terms, Bratton's The Stack, which many of you might have seen, uh, what he's interested there is how, again, planetary, what he calls planetary scale computation is <clears throat> is, is integrating many of the different zones of the Earth that, that have maybe separate domains, even maybe separate logics, but that they're integrating along these different, different scales and thereby penetrating and rearranging the different, different kinds of organizations on the Earth, and particularly political organizations, in a way that will challenge the kinds of orders that we've been used to and therefore also challenging the kinds of vocabularies and concepts that we use to address them. And in particular, looking at what we mean by political order, which is the topic um, for today, he says that planetary scale computation <clears throat> not only deforms and distorts Westphalian political geography, in other words, the traditional nation state formations that still uh, organize much of the globe, it creates new territories in its own image. And by that, he means the digital world is, is producing new kinds of political or semi political domains that don't map onto traditional spatial categories. <clears throat> now here Bratton is often referring to the work of Carl Schmitt that some of you may know, but he's a very important theorist of the political, trying to get at what is the essence of the political, and particularly in his work after the war where he was interested in the international organization of the world. He was interested in this question of space, and he said every fundamental order is a spatial order and he, and he used this word, the Greek word for law, nomos, to, 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 uh, to represent this idea of a spatial order that has a certain kind of organizational, uh, systematic, legal, and in a special way, a kind of legal organization. And what I want to draw attention to here is he also was very interested in 1950 when the old order was literally destroyed in the Second World War, a kind of global civil war that every significant alteration, every resituating of the image of the Earth is bound up with world political alterations and a new division of the Earth. And that would be, of course, the Cold War. Uh, but here we can say this is what's happening today in the digital revolution. We're looking at a new, a new image of the Earth and new situations, new reorganizations of the world, and we need new 
know most new organizations that are appropriate to it. Now he says that's new land appropriation, which might be old fashioned, but Bratton is suggesting we need to think again about how the world should be organized in the 21st century, and he suggests how do we think about, let's say, the nomos of the cloud. We can still think in political terms, or we need to think in political terms about these new organizations. Um, so he suggests that the nomos of the cloud is a kind of machine that is a state held together by deciding spaces of technical exceptions as much as legal ones. So here he's playing off of Schmidt because Schmidt is again also famous for thinking about the state as um, fundamentally about sovereignty of exception, sovereign rule as not about law, but as exception and decision. And so um, this is, I think, something that we need to think about more carefully in the 21st century. What do we really mean by the political? What do we really mean by states? Are these concepts even relevant for this particular moment? So to get started on this question, I'll just think about three models, they're not exhaustive, but three ways that we can think about the political and its challenge before going back to, to Schmidt and rethinking the question of the political in the 21st century. <clears throat> the first one would be the digital as a kind of neutralization or depoliticization uh, in the 21st century. And that's, I think, what, what people are getting at with the idea of algorithmic decision-making or algorithmic governmentality. In other words, the machine learning method is to keep uh, eliminating the unpredictable, eliminating decision, and in some ways eliminating the political altogether, at least as an ideal. At the same time, that same process of, of algorithmic governmentality could be seen as a hyper-politicization in the way that Deleuze was suggesting, in that in the right hands, that totalization of tracking, prediction, um, and monitoring could be understood as a route towards a kind of totalized control society. The problem, of course, in the 21st century is that where do we divide the political control, the political prediction, from something like non-political or semi-political institutions? Where does uh, an entity like Google fit into this matrix when it's not necessarily a state institution? Uh, that's something we need to think about. The other point that Brown brings up is the digital could be seen as a re-territorialization um, in a kind of non-space. In other words, it's not a land territory, it's not a traditional state territory. The nomos of the cloud, perhaps, is a new form of the political. So these are questions that, that at least are a challenge, but, but common to them all are these kind of what, what we could we call Schmidtian themes of where is the political, what is the political, and is the political being repressed or neutralized? So I'll start with the first <clears throat> section of the talk, which is the concept of the political, which is a Schmidt uh, question. And, and I want to rethink this, this topic through the question of the technical, because Schmidt was always interested in technology. So we'll begin with the concept of the political itself. So the key point here, if you haven't read the concept of the political, is Schmidt's effort in the 1920s and 30s to identify what was specific about the political. Because we know that there are states, there's governments, there's many different entities that we talk about in terms of the political. But the political must, he says, rest on its own distinctions. So what is essential to the political? Well, famously, he argued that the specific political distinction is what he called the friend-enemy distinction. And there's many different ways that we can read that, but what I'd like to suggest here that, that I think is one of the most important implications is that the effort to identify the essential political distinction as the friend-enemy distinction is Schmidt's effort to reduce the political to its purely existential dimension. And by that, I think he's trying to sidestep a whole tradition of political theory by saying the political is really a system of organization not a problem of identifying some kind of relationship between citizens and state authority, a long history that goes back through the history of political thought. In other words, the political is simply a question of how a system, a political unity, maintains itself. Similarly, his famous definition of sovereignty is he who decides on the exception, which is defined as the case of extreme peril, is again, Defining sovereignty not as 
some kind of position in a state that must be legitimated through an argument of some kind related to its um, related to the social contract or to some kind of political theory tradition. Basically, what he says is the state, the sovereign, can suspend the law on the, in the exception on the basis of its right of self-preservation. So it's fundamentally a function identified in terms of the system as a kind of self-justifying entity. Now, the reason I think that we can read it this way is because Schmidt himself brings into the equation the language of organisms and life. As he says in political theology, in the exception, the power of real life breaks through the crust of a mechanism that has become torpid by repetition. So the idea is that the mechanism of a technology cannot sustain itself in the way that a real living entity can. <clears throat> now this echoes, I think, in an important way, biological thinking of the time, which also has this kind of crisis um, language. Uh, a good example is the, at this time, the biologist uh, Ludwig von Bertalanti, great name, if you haven't heard it before, who later becomes the founder of systems theory. And he says, a completely mechanized organism would be incapable of regulation following disturbances. But even earlier before this, the edge of the First World War, Walter Cannon was thinking of the body in the same way. A body normally regulates itself in normal circumstances, but is also capable of moving into what he called kind of emergency conditions in order to deal with um, crisis. So he called literally this, this system a kind of emergency function. Now, Cannon is famous for naming the fight or flight mechanism in the body, but also famous for the term homeostasis, which he introduces through his collaborator uh, Rosenbluth into cybernetics. Now, when he talked about the parallels between the body and, and the body politic, Walter Cannon was very explicit about using terms that echo Schmidt. For example, he says stability is characterized by alterations of the fluid. This is manifest when bodily welfare is imperiled by enemies. And again, using this language about contests that are essentially defined by life or death, existential battles. The body is unified, integrated for a single purpose, surviving. So Schmidt, I think, is, is under, understanding the political in these kinds of terms, not as something to be justified in a traditional political theory, but in terms of the, the existence of an entity. So even in cybernetics, um, which is developing in the same period, we have the same kind of language of systems and survival rather than legitimating uh, certain kinds of relationships. So whether it's a machine, a cybernetic entity, or a living organism, we can understand it as a device that locally and temporarily resists the general tendency for the increase of entropy. Now, that's to say that, it, that, a, that an organism or a machine is always threatened by breakdown and it has to try to overcome that tendency. And again, the language is interesting that Wiener uses by its ability to make decisions. It can produce around it a local zone of organization in a world whose general tendency is to run down. So Wiener is again here emphasizing in the cybernetic context that the entity must decide at certain moments how to maintain itself against uh, potential crisis. <clears throat> okay, so what about then the relationship uh, uh, between the machine and the organism? Because Schmidt seems to valorize the organism against the repetition of the machine, as others do. But here with cybernetics, of course, we have this, this implication of the machine and the organism as, at least in some ways, fundamentally identical, or at least uh, analogical. So in 1938, Schmidt wrote a book on Hobbes Leviathan, where he uh, zeroed in on exactly this problem. So at first, he really defines the state as a machine, or at least through Hobbes, says that he was the first one to grasp that the state was a machine, essentially. And we kind of see the implications of that in the famous frontispiece to Hobbes, Hobbes's um, text, that we kind of see that it's an artificial entity constructed of all these different elements in order to make this grand, um, this grand entity. 
So as Schmidt says very clearly, the Leviathan thus becomes none other than a huge machine, a gigantic mechanism in the service of ensuring the physical protection of those governed. One of the things he's emphasizing here in 1938 is the, the instrumentality, let's say, of this, this entity. And it's, it's at least in part a veiled critique of what he takes to be the, the excesses at this time of the Third Reich and the modern state in general. At the same time, he, he says, this is not the whole story. Because in referring to Hobbes's vision of the state, he, he also alludes to a very important part of Hobbes's argument, which is, as Hobbes says in the introduction, the great Leviathan is an artificial man, a kind of automaton. But he also says, and in which the sovereignty is an artificial soul, as giving life and motion to the whole body. So in the automaton, unlike the, the real human, we need this artificial soul, because Hobbes is pretty clear that the human doesn't have a soul. Animals don't have souls. So the automaton, the robot, actually needs the sovereign, the function of sovereignty, to give this machine life and motion. So as he explicitly says in the book on Leviathan, <clears throat> Hobbes transferred the Cartesian conception of man as a mechanism with a soul onto the huge man. So the machine is now animated by the sovereign. So, so this is an important part of Hobbes' uh, argument, according to Schmidt, is that the artifice that is the state, there is no natural state. The state is a machine. But the mis machine cannot be simply a machine. It needs to be animated. It has to have that life force in order for it to properly act as a political entity. And you can see where, where, where he's going to go. The, the political aspect of the machine is so it won't be caught in the automaticity of, rep of repetition. When we go back, we'll see the sovereign is one who can decide in the exception. The sovereignty of the Hobbesian machine will be able to decide over and against the repetition of the automatic machine. Now the danger, according to, to, to Schmidt, as he outlines in this text, is that the machinery of the state rapidly escalates in the history of technology and the history of the state. With the incredible development of, of machinery, communication, weaponry, and so on, the machine of the state uh, becomes quite astonishing. And as he already predicted in 1922, the, the alignment of the state as machine with science as a kind of worldview means that the sovereign inside the state is gradually repressed, eliminated, to the point where the machine now runs by itself. Sovereignty has been eliminated from the machine. So this is where we are with Schmidt in this period of the interwar and even in the Second World War, just before the Second World War. And we can see then why, by 1929, when he's worried about the problem of neutralization of the state, neutralization of the political, and the problem of technology, that he can say the century can only be understood provisionally as the century of technology. Technology is the key problem. It's not that technology is necessarily the problem, but we are living in a time of potential automaticity of the state machine and the neutralization of the political. But as we know with Schmidt, the political never really goes away. And what's, what's the challenge of the day is going to be what kind of politics will be capable of mastering the technology, what genuine friend of any groupings will be able to develop on this new Okay, so that's the, the first section, is that, the, the, that for Schmidt, the political is clearly linked with the machinery of the state, but could never be reduced to the automaticity of the state. So part two is a cybernetic concept of the political. So to start with Bateson again, <clears throat> when we seek to explain the behavior of a man or any other organism, the system will usually not have the same limits as the self. So again, to get back to the idea of that that is so prominent in the post-war period, especially in cybernetics and, and with Bateson, individual humans are enmeshed in technical systems, but it's not just that humans are enmeshed in systems, it's that humans are defined by their participation in networks. And this is well before after network theory or distributed cognition theory. But I just would like to emphasize that Schmidt was also interested after the war in exactly the same problem as it relates to the issue of the technicity of politics. As he noted in a dialogue from 1954, the human, he says, is able to compensate 
to overcompensate in a way, in a monstrous way, for his biological weakness and inadequacy through technological invention. So he's understanding the human is always, in some ways, in a prosthetic relationship with technology. And by this, he really is talking about the, the escalation of prosthetics into, especially the nuclear era. And he has a very interesting kind of proto-Laturian um, remark here on atomic weaponry. The human arm that holds the bomb, the brain that innervates the muscles of the human arm, is in the decisive moment, um, in this kind of context, less an appendage of the individual human than a pro pro prosthesis or a part of the technical and social apparatus that produces the bomb and deploys it. So in other words, it's not the human that's depressing the bomb and creating this particular military event. It's actually, it's actually a result of the system itself. So it's no longer the human as a human, but it's rather a chain reaction unleashed from the human that achieves all this particular work. So after the war, what we can say is the problem is no longer the automaticity of the state and the possibility of the human relation to that, but it's actually the humans are now enmeshed inside the automaticity of the state as a system of automatic technology with the, with the new challenge of the highly destructive power of nuclear weapons. So just to put it another way, the power of the individual now for Schmidt is only a kind of <coughs> secretion Auschwitzung of a situation that results from a system of incalculably enhanced division of labor. So what I want to suggest then is that in the post-war period, as for Schmidt in the interwar period, the question of the political was how in this system where everything is so intertwined and enmeshed with the danger of automaticity, where was the political? And that, I think, was the question for what I would call these, these individuals interested in the cybernetic concept of the political. Um, Figures like David Easton, who were the first in America to, to try to use cybernetic and systems theory approaches to identify, like Schmidt, to distinguish a political system from other systems, to identify what was the political and how to um, isolate it, and again, in some ways, as with Schmidt, to protect and to, to, to save from neutralization the explicitly political dimension of these highly networked and highly highly distributed systems. So when we look at this particular effort to understand a cybernetic concept of the political, it was not a technocratic effort to neutralize the political. If you look at this, okay, it looks a little simplistic, but if you look at the, the basic argument here from 1957, it does not eliminate the decision. It actually puts the decision into play within this feedback uh, orientation. Similarly, with Carl Deutsch's uh, effort to look at how models from the natural and social sciences could come into play, he was rejecting the tradition of simplistic mechanism, which was repetition of the older kind, the kind of implicit finalism of old-style mechanism. He was rejecting organicism, which was also inappropriate, and looking to new technologies, which were reactive, adaptive, cybernetic ones, as a way of thinking anew about human societies and human organization. So when he came to write his uh, relatively famous book, The Nerves of Government, which was translated into German as political cybernetics, he understood governments or political systems as networks of decision and control, dependent on these highly integrated processes of communication and so on, but they were networks of decision and control, not elimination of decision. So what he was thinking of were these kinds of processes. This is from the uh, Army Diagram from 1946. So when we look at his diagram from his book, The Nerves of Government, 1963, you can't really see everything, how it's working there. But if we take a closer look, you'll see, again, in, inside that, that complex cybernetic system, we have tentative decisions, policies, final decisions, they're, they're actually not eliminated, they're, they're, simply, they're simply part of the network of that community model. And what he was arguing is that we just need to look at the political system, uh, even earlier political systems, in a different way. Decision points can be concentrated and distributed in different ways. So we could re-describe a 
monarchical system from early modern Europe as just a highly concentrated decision system where decisions were made in a very centralized point. But that doesn't mean that other systems couldn't be described that had more distributed decision points. The, the, the main argument was a political system has to maintain itself through information, feedback, and control. And as long as the system could maintain itself, that was the key problem. And I think this was not that incompatible with what Schmidt was trying to argue in the interwar period. The political was not about legitimation, it was about survival of a particular entity. So equilibrium, which he brings into the equation, shouldn't be seen as something simplistic, like a homeostatic model of a crude, um, of a crude kind, but a very complex one, that, that a system was very, very distributed, and many things were going on at once. So I don't want you to think of the cybernetic concept of the political as it was developed here as being uh, very, very crude. It was more along the lines of what Bertolanffy was, was developing in his own work, what he meant by an open system that could have many different temporary stabilities going on within a larger system. <clears throat> okay, so again, another parallel with Schmidt here. What Deutsch called literally plasticity in his text, the point was that these systems that could learn from the past and that could adapt to new circumstances and point to new futures, I mean, this is the positive way of discussing it. It says, thanks to what it's learned, it's not subject to the present. It can still learn, so it's not subject to the past. It can rearrange itself in response to new challenges. So there's an interplay. The point is, is it's plastic and capable of new orientations. And one of the ways that he put this in the text is that the cybernetic machine state could have the function of autonomous internal habit breaking that was necessary if it was going to be capable of rising to new challenges. And I think one of the ways that we could think about this in today's language was the function of disautomatization. Or, I don't think it's implausible to say that this was a new way in cybernetic terms of describing what Schmidt called the sovereign power of suspending law in moments of exception. Again, another text from 1974, Steinbrenner's The Cybernetic Theory of Decision, it's about, it's about disruption. Learning occurs when there's systematic change in the pattern of activity in the organization. And this is called disruption. So one more example, <clears throat> what Deutsch called in 1971 blind zeal, the automatic acting out of pre-rehearsed routines, may be tolerable, even necessary, for short periods of time, provided that these old routines are not too inappropriate to the new tasks. But of course, they can be destructive if they prevent new kinds of orientations or new kinds of decisions. So what was interesting is that he was, he was arguing that this was true whether it was the Western states or the communist states, that openness, resourcefulness, new possibilities, and so on, new knowledge, these were necessary as states were going to survive in a complex new world. And that, I think, was essential to his cybernetic concept of the political, was this possibility of novelty. Okay, so the last section of my talk, the catacomb of the cybernetic age. So we'll start with this quote from Norbert Wiener, <clears throat> the arch enemy disorganization. So remember that, that Wiener's approach to the, the cybernetic entity was that it was always working against entropy to create order against a kind of uh, eternal, eternal tendency to, to break down and, and, and disorder. So there was always this essence of a kind of, uh, I don't know what the word for it would be, in, in life it's a kind of miracle of working against this uh, universal tendency to break down. The machine was capable of something similar if it was organized, again, as a cybernetic machine. The religious version of this that Schmidt was interested in is what's called the catacon, it comes from Thessalonians, which is this mysterious Pauline idea that, that there is this figure that can work to restrain the lawlessness of the Antichrist as we await the second coming of Christ. Now, in uh, The Nomos of the Earth from 1950, Schmidt positioned this figure as a kind of political, or at least um, a kind of legal figure, 
as the restrainer of the Antichrist understood literally as lawlessness in the sense of disorder on the plane of political and, and legal order on a global scene. If human history is, as he said, between times, in political theology too, he said, the Christian era is a single long period of waiting between two simultaneities. So if we have the appearance of Christ and the second coming, there is no continuity between those two. Human history is purely secular. In between those times, there's no appearance, there's no divine presence. Human history has no order. All we have is a tendency to disorder, to chaos. So the kind of Hobbesian perspective of Schmidt is at once 100% secular and 100% theological. They're both the same thing. So the, the catacon is a figure that has no divine presence. It's simply a secular figure that restrains disorder in a temporary way while awaiting the second coming. So if we put it that way, the catacon is not a direct figure. So what, what I would want to suggest is that the catacomb relates to the political in this way. The political is the figure that defers chaos, that works against entropy, and doesn't instantiate order. In other words, the political is the kind of figure that is like the, the cybernetic <coughs> entity that Wiener discusses. Uh, to put it another way, the political is the on-the-ground organizer of order that, that, that produces those kind of Hobbesian moments of shelter on the earth. So what the catacomb does is something different. So to not confuse the, those different figures, the, the catacomb is someone that restrains lawlessness, but not in the way that the political does. As um, Paolo Verno has written recently, I think this is an interesting way to look at it, the catacomb is opposed to the atrophy of the openness to the world which sounds mysterious, but we need to think of the catacomb as someone not directly linked to the political, but linked to the political in this more indirect way. And what I'd like to suggest then is that what the catacomb does is protects the system of the plurality of political unities, which are individually shelters against this radical disorder. And this is what I think Schmidt was trying to do in Nomos of the Earth. In other words, the catacomb is the one that from a global perspective, in particular, as world history develops, is the figure that helps protect the system of all of the different political unities. Because as he emphasized more and more after the war, any one political form is always a fragment of a larger plural system of political units. So that classic decisionist figure that he explained in the earlier text was always part of a larger system of states. So I'll try and explain that just briefly here with the historical forms of the catacomb as Schmidt developed them. The first one would be the Roman Empire, which is the one that, that is often pointed to in the early, the early examples of the text. But more interesting, I think, for Schmidt was oops, the Holy Roman Empire. <clears throat> because the Holy Roman Empire, which comes after the breakdown of the Roman Empire, it consists of all these different states with different, different units and different different um, you know, monarchs and dukes and so on. So who was this guy, the Holy Roman Emperor? Um, I don't actually really know that much about the Holy Roman Emperor. But the point that Schmidt makes is that it's not like the Holy Roman Emperor was the super monarch of this territory. He was not a super sovereign. He was not elevated above all the monarchs. He didn't have a role to play that was institutionally defined in some specific legal sense. What he says instead was the monarch, the monarchs often gave the emperor just special missions and commissions to kind of keep things working. So the point is that the Holy Roman Emperor was the kind of uh, fixer that kept the system operating in order for the whole <coughs> unity to maintain itself. So the idea there is that, that that was the role of the catacomb in this particular system, was to maintain the unity of the whole system through interventions. This becomes much more clear in Westphalian Europe, where you have what really is the appearance of Hobbes's machine states, who operate in a very tightly organized system of, of individual nations, like what we'll now call nation states, um, 
that is organized precisely to limit war and to operate as a kind of system. And here's where we can see Schmidt bringing up a kind of new idea of catacontic order that is much more ephemeral, because he says, and here the language is kind of cybernetic, these new great men, which is the Hobbesian term, have their equal rights, but they, they also have a kind of role to play in what he calls the system of a territorial equilibrium. And that equilibrium was also, as we know, a kind of global equilibrium that Schmidt goes into some detail explaining the, the importance of, <clears throat> of the colonies for maintaining the pressures of, of state interaction. So that continues, obviously, with colonization in the 19th century. His point here is that this global order requires a very historically specific orientation around certain kinds of equilibrium that are, as he says in this quote, unrepeatable. It's an unrepeatable historical event. It's only if we like discovered a new planet where we could like fight over uh, new resources that we could relieve this. So his, his, his goal here, as he's writing in 1950, is that we're in this new spatial order where there is no place uh, beyond the, the, the bipolar organization of the Cold War system. And he's searching or trying to explain what will be the catacomb to preserve the system of this whole, this, this, this whole totalized global order. And it's not clear that there is one, but, but the, the, the question I'd just like to pose here right now is to say it has to be for the whole system. It can't simply be the catacomb of one side or the other. And, and I'd also like to emphasize that this is a a system that relies on a certain infrastructure of technology. The, the Cold War system is sort of built into it was a tight infrastructure of technology. And this is the question that Schmidt was posing earlier, and it's the question that's being posed, obviously, by <clears throat> many commentators in the cybernetic period. So at least it's possible to think, what is the role that technology plays? It either accelerates the disorder, or it could restrain the disorder. It's, it's, it's the question of automaticity and openness at least we have to think about the role of the infrastructure of technology and the possibility of the catacomb in the Cold War period, but clearly for our own period. And that's just where I want to, to, to begin to end, which is where is the catacomb going to come when we have the Antichrist and the Leviathan of the contemporary era? Because as Schmidt says, the new Leviathan is this new autonomous entity, the machine state. And in our own era, Clearly, we're still trying to, to, to juggle with this problem of how to think about the new technologies and the infrastructures of, of power. And we're not exactly sure where to locate the edges of these things, but we know that they exist in this kind of um, traditional context of the state power, but also in other forms. So I don't want to privilege this one, but it's just an obvious one. So that's my, my ending here, which I'll, I'll just spin through a couple of speculative hypotheses, or one speculative hypothesis on the contemporary form of the catacomb and the algorithmic era. That's a very ponderous phrase. So I think this is just where we might want to, to look, which is the catacomb is not the political. <clears throat> the political is still going to be judging where the killing and the fighting and the death is, is happening at the level of, of that kind of Schmidtian friend enemy um, structure. But the catacomb could be about provoking openness and adaptive power within and across these techno political systems that are tending to increasing autocratization. That's, that's, I think, an important aspect of the catacomb. As well as creating, which I don't think is necessarily the same thing, but as well as creating potential for genuine decisions, which is the interruption of norms and the possibility of, of, of new. Um, new directions. Both of these, I think, would be necessary to maintain security when there are extreme uh, crises and emergencies, both within political units, but also in the interaction and configuration of political systems um, at a broader and, and global scale. Because the catacomb, as I want to emphasize here again, is not a supra-systemic power decision or a centralized system of control and command. And what I'd like to, to end with is, is uh, a comment that Schmidt made soon after the end of the war, which emphasizes that the catacomb does not have to be understood as a single figure. And I think this is something that could be really useful for us to think about 
the way that we could understand the power of the catacon in a time where the locations of power are extremely difficult to target, very difficult to map, and very difficult to understand in a distributed era. He said that the catacon um, could be understood in this way. There are temporary and transient, splintered and fragmentary holders of this function. So I'll stop there and say thank you. So I think we have time for a few questions and then we can take a quick break and then we'll start with our second topic. Second so. How did you want to do the microphones or no? I uh, know actually I think we're probably fine. We're fine, okay. Yeah. Hi. Thanks so much for a great talk because um, I, I can definitely see the kind of uh, the historical map. Uh, which we were talking about before, and um, I'm very interested in this kind of the way you weaving on one end the cybernetization of decision, um, which it seems to me that you know you are uh, locating in a historical period that is pre-cybernetic. I might be wrong, but you know whether you know the question of the Leviathan obviously is uh, you know it kind of somehow refers back to a, a, yes. a sovereign model of politics that didn't exist until cybernetics. Yes. So cybernetics obviously addresses the question of, uh, of entropy, the relation between the tangible between information and, and, um, and randomness, or, or, and um, you know, the, the first model of cybernetics, cybernetic, uh, the first order, the linear order, is obviously about um, trying to um, organize order, or try, to, or at least it's about try to um, use entropy in a way that the system could function. Okay, so it's still a closed system, and you know you obviously refer to Bates and the second order cybernetics. So there is some kind, there is some kind of overlap between first order and the second order. <coughs> Plus, there is this kind of pro looking back at the Leviathan as a kind of precursor. Uh, of I wonder why Schmidt is doing all this work. You know, why is he doing all this work about you know looking at this previous story, pre-cybernetic form, but then at the same time you know you read into him the first story that the second order cybernetic, which are you know 40s and 50s, 60s, and um, and the problem that you address seems to me very addressed with the political is on oh, one end governability decisions works through this complex forms of cybernetic uh, organization where we, which are on one end, you know, first order, so against entropy, and on the other hand, of a second order, order and using like entropy. So it becomes productive of the order rather than just eliminating mm -hmm. entropy. And then how do you relate that relation to when you talk about the political as being megantropic? So I'm just trying to figure out, you know, the, the the possibility of districating the political decision from an historical moment, basically an historical moment of um, you know sovereign yes. decisionism towards you know a kind of political moment where you know um, it seems to me that we need another language or whether we are working with the language of the entropy, you know. What are we doing when we work with the language of the entropy vis a vis this kind of, of historical view that we're given where you know Schmidt works between second and yeah, first and second and cybernetic, looking back historically but actually really revitalizing the level. Well, yeah, I mean the first answer so, is that sorry, I, I know, is that big no, no, it is, it's good. I mean I would like to do it more rigorously no, as part of the book. No, as part of the book project. But I do think that there's a a kind of um, mist trajectory by mm -hmm. by seeing like okay we know that canon feeds forward into cybernetics through biology and there's a kind of linear perspective there but there has not been a lot of attention paid to the sideways kind of analogies let's say between the biological thinking and the political thinking mm -hmm. in the post post-war period mm -hmm. but you know that Stefanos and, and Todd Meyer's book mm -hmm. is going to do some of that work 
but, yeah. but there is so much rich material there for thinking about broader discourses of crisis, order, biological, political, and social in that interwar period that Schmidt is clearly part of. And, mm -hmm. and you see it in his own text with the writing about life and mechanism, his own interest in technology go back to the First World War, mm -hmm. that, that, that we need to pay attention to those crisscrossing patterns as well. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to say that Schmidt is talking about entropy necessarily, but the interest in entropy is also echoing other discourses of order, disorder, that are equally interested in sort of non-metaphysical new languages, let's say, of, mm -hmm. that, that come out of biology and, and crisscross, let's say, into socio-political terms that Schmidt is very much aware of. Mm -hmm. Especially when he starts talking about these, <coughs> these technical problems. So that's part of the answer. And I think that Schmidt also pays attention to some of those things after the war, which people lose track of when they only read the interwar writings like some of those quotes show. So the other side of it is that I just think that we haven't been reading the political theory associated with cybernetics that might have a way of thinking differently about second order cybernetics because it's not exactly the same thing. So I don't know if that's answering yeah, your question. No, I, just, not, I prefer not, to work more like sideways and rather than no, thinking absolutely. that it's a one-way trajectory. And there's, a, there's an interesting history there have something to say about non-automatic or dis like that, like what Deutsch is saying, like the disautomatization theory, rather than simply that everything to do with cybernetics was about was like the Heideggerian you know end of philosophy. Or something. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, I'm still at the Dania with the uh, Bateson Idea Group established by Nora Bateson, and uh, I have some qualms uh, with uh, representing. Bateson as a techno-optimist, but especially I want to note specifically how he anticipated some of the criticisms that you, in fact, were making, yeah, just, I, I, and, I and specifically that, yeah. with respect to the critique of game theory, and uh, either explicitly or implicitly, and certainly explicitly in his letters, von Neumann's use of game theory in the whole Cold War environment. And the point with that being that as you use game theory to reinforce the rules of the game as they are being played, you destabilize the larger game and what you need is someone to um, you know, change the game as a whole. Right. Maybe that's your catacomb because it's certainly not within yeah. this, uh, as he would term it, a schismogenesis of <laughs> of the algorithmization, you know, he was worried about this algorithmization. Yeah, I totally agree with you, yeah, and, and Deutsch says all. something similar about that. No, I, what I meant, I didn't mean to, to make him too optimistic, because in fact, the last thing I did with Bateson was actually, he was the opposite, and he was, he was more, he was less, um, he was not actually, I think, optimistic <coughs> enough about some of the resources of the he was a little bit too concerned about the pathology of the machine, I think, in my view. You know, he didn't, he didn't see all the possibilities of the computer, let's put it that way. And in some ways he links it with the fundamental pathology of, of technology, you know, of writing even. So I agree with you that I, I, what I meant was he kind of, he didn't always, um, he did often see the value of these systems as having creative potential. Which I don't disagree with either. Like I think Bateson has a lot to say for us. But what I wanted to, to use him at the beginning was he's usually seen as someone who will provide this more open, creative approach to the systems, whereas what we're dealing with now is everyone emphasizing this algorithmic disaster. So if I if I had to, to do a broader kind of analysis, I would say what we need to do now is to kind of go back and, and mine these resources, which would include Bateson for how do we rethink these, these distributed networks in ways that do emphasize the creative potential without losing track of, of the way that the digital algorithmic turn that they didn't always see the full extent of has, has really changed the, changed the game in a way that is quite serious. So, I, but I take your, your point. I'll be more careful next time. Yes? Thinking about 
thinking about. Um, and I need to, this is sort of something I want to work on in this like a new book, so I don't really have it all figured out. I think I was getting kind of pessimistic that the political was sort of lost for us. In part because, especially if we take Schmidt's view seriously, the political isn't about representation and voting and, and <coughs> resisting and having some say in what happens. Like, if it's really this existential category, and especially if it's expanded to be terrains that are really quite complex right now, it's really where decisions are being made about the killing and the, the dying. It's very difficult to see where, where we have a like, place. It's more like an analytic category. So what, what I started to think about was that the catacomb, especially if you think of it as distributed in this way, it is something that may be distributed in an interesting way in these in-between spaces. And that, that's the place where, where something like um, uh, a kind of continual resistance to automaticity might actually be something that is a role that we can take on. It's just kind of maybe a fantastical mm -hmm. idea. Mm -hmm. You know, like we often think of there's so much of the political is so negative. It's like resistance and kind of these anarchist, anarchistic kind of tendencies, but they don't seem to go anywhere conceptually in a lot of like, positive directions. But I, I'd like to think more about it, but I just didn't really have much to say. Let's put it that way. That's the, the, there's not much to say about the concept of the political right now because it's still going to be, it hasn't changed really. Whereas the catacontic dimension is one that is really quite novel. And the configuration. That's really where a lot of the action seems to be. It's like what's going to stabilize a quite an unstable system of political activity. But I, I could say more about that, but I just like maybe we'll talk more to the panel. I'll have to think more. But you notice the good weakness there. Mark. Are there places where the catacomb is not? I mean, well, it's, it's not guaranteed because it's not a divine yeah. it's nothing like God does not send the catacomb. According to Schmidt. So, and if it's a political theology analog, it's also not given. So the 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 catacon is just something that will, if it's there, is the one that stabilizes the system. Now, with all of Schmidt's categories, the idea is that it, if it's there, it could it could be cultivated. So if we think of the a really crude idea of the catacon is the one that holds the balance of power. So if you had like the Soviet Union and the and the NATO block, the catacomb would be the one that helps keep them in balance. But, but what's the institutional or legal or configuration of space that can help balance the two superpowers? It can't be a state, it can't be a person, it can't be a, the UN. So one of the things that he argues later is that it's this, literally the space of proxy warfare. That becomes a kind of catacomb-like dimension to the Cold War that allows for the stabilization of those, those um, conflicts. So it, it just either happens or it doesn't. I mean, you just hope that there is going to be one and then maybe it can be cultivated. But the worst thing is to escalate the anti canticon which is to escalate the possibility of disorder by moralizing, enmity, and, and so on. Now, the same with the concept of the political. So just because there's killing doesn't mean there's the political. If you're killing for economic reasons, killing for religious reasons, that doesn't mean it's political. So again, it's to try and identify and to emphasize that the killing is on existential grounds, and that's where the political should be located as an analytic category. So, but the catacomb's not guaranteed. Neither is the political. It can be neutralized and there can be depoliticizations. And that's kind of what I'm trying to suggest, maybe not always so clearly, is that Today is another moment like the 1920s and 30s where through technology there's, there's another process of displacements and neutralizations of the political in domains that used to be either very politicized or strongholds. <coughs> it doesn't mean it's going away, but there's a, a challenge to locate the political again. There's another regime in which it can operate. Yeah, or it might be displaced into places that, that aren't political, or there's places taking on the role of the political didn't use to be political. <coughs> Whatever, killing that's become privatized or places that used to take on the role of protection that don't do it anymore, that kind of thing. Oh, sorry. So maybe 
um, so my question is um, in related to the I think about the relation between the political and the technological. How are we going to get out of a double bind of the political? Now let me explain what do I mean by double bind of the political. You will reference the basic. And if we look at what is the whole uh, mentality of algorithmic um, governmentality, so what we are seeing is that every nation state is speeding up their development of artificial intelligence, deep learning, so on and so forth. This is the national policy, for example, uh, in China, in, in Russia. Uh, in, in August, I think, when I remember China has launched a white paper about uh, to become a leader of AI in 2013. Two weeks after, Putin said to the Russian children, was Richard, that was the uh, 1st of September, he says that who lives in AI will rule the world. So we see that there is a competition towards the technological similarity, and that is the terrain of, um, of the battlefield of geopolitics today. But on the other hand, if, if, I mean, if you follow your, your logic and with this question of full automation decision making, it is inside, inside this process of competition, it is actually a process of depolitization. Why? Because you know that the, if, the, if we imagine we have a super intelligence which is able to do all the planning and which is doing much better than human beings, to, you know, so this is a uh, significant process of decolonization. So actually, we are inside the double bind of the political in relation to technology. And how, how do you think about this? Well, it's not necessary to have a because, as Schmidt says, it's it's possible to to still retain genuine decision within that, that situation or like Deutsch would as well by simply making sure that there's zones of reflection and human decision making inside the state for what how those AIs are deployed and how the systems are actually managed. It's just a resistance to to the, the complete reliance on automated systems. So it's not necessarily the double line. It's just that it is a danger of, of that reliance. Well, I'm not very sure because if you want to speak towards the, uh, the, the technological similarity, at the same time you refrain yourself from that. You know that is the, the dilemma, and and that is something I think that is. Well, I, I do kind of agree with you, and I think that's why the 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 danger of the particularly the era of the digital automaticity is that it's very difficult to retract from one of the zones because it always gets replicated and, and infiltrated by another sphere. So with, with Schmidt, he was always interested in the different spheres, but now all the spheres are inter interlinked and networked and, 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 let's say, translated by the exact same technologies. So I kind of agree with you. I, that's why I'm not sure what to say about the political, to be honest. That's why the catacomb ends up being kind of more interesting. All right, I think I should stop and um, take a break, and we'll be back in like 15 minutes for a few. So thank you. <laughs>